perfect. Hey, the snow is falling. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah. Only on the tube. Where's that fire? No, it's rain. <sighs> I know. <laughs> Please, let's stand together. Thank you so much, gentlemen. 
You know what this band needs? It needs some um, women. It needs some women. Cowbell. <laughs> we need some women in this band. So uh, hint, hint, hint. Hey, I, I'm, I want to ask you all to do me a very small favor. If you don't do it, I won't like you. It, it's easy. What I'd like you to do before you leave this morning Take a little piece of paper, rip it off your bulletin, take it out of your purse, whatever you have to do, and answer a question for me. Just say it like this, music too loud, music not too loud. Last couple weeks, some people come up to me and say, hey, Steve, it's too loud. Um, maybe it is, but I need to know what the majority feel. It's kind of like a thermostat. You know, you give somebody a thermostat, it's too hot in here, it's too cold in here, and it's all day, you know. Music volumes are similar. Everybody has their own preferences. You know, but if a lot of you think it's too loud, then it's too loud. You know, if only a couple of you do, it's, you know, maybe we just need to push you back or something. I don't know. But I do want everybody's feedback. So if you'd be so kind, before you leave this morning, do either, oh, put it in the offering boxes. Thank you. Yep, put it in the offering boxes. And we'll tally those up, and then we will um, see what we see. And thank you very much. So this week... We, um, did our, we did our scripture reading, and um, something really jumped out at me. We were reading through uh, Proverbs, we are reading through some other p- books of the Bible, but I think we hit like seven Proverbs this week, and talking, how to use our mouths, was addressed at least 30 times. So I'm thinking, this is a significant issue, and it's especially a significant issue in this week's reading. But come on, just a few, few Proverbs, 30 times? So I started doing some thinking just on the idea of talking. And I remember this saying, it's a real famous one, loose lips sink ships. You guys ever heard that? Or originally it was loose lips might sink ships. And so I guess we dropped the word might because it was just too hard to remember. I don't know. This is an actual poster. This comes from the US Office of War Information. World War II. The idea was they wanted people to be very careful about what they said because they might inadvertently give helpful information to the enemy. And so there was this big campaign, you know, keep your mouth shut, watch what you're saying, because it can end result catastrophe, disaster for the war effort. And you're thinking, this is World War II, you know, no cell phones, no computers. You couldn't just pick up the phone and call somebody in Cuba or Germany and say, hey, guess what? So if they were worried about it then, how much more so now when you could just send a little tweet and cover the globe with it? Loose lips sink ships. 30 times this week, God spoke to us about how we talk. God speaks to speech. So what I did is I took all of those 30-some-odd passages that I easily came across, and I analyzed them just briefly and categorized them. And you have that in your notes. If you have your uh, bulletin with you this morning, you have a little table, but it's up here on the screen. And yes, I know it's small, but you can pick up one of the bulletins and have it personal-sized for yourself, (laughs) super-sized. All right, seven categories. Talk can trap you or deliver you. And you'll notice there were two Proverbs that talked about that. Talk can reward you. There were four passages on that. I threw in Leviticus uh, 19 also. Talk can harm or heal. Eight passages. So this to me says, hey, if he talks about this the most, this must be one of the most significant ones. And then lying versus telling the truth, that's addressed three times in our reading this week. Using restraints. That was addressed five times, and I threw a couple more passages in there for you, for a total of seven, but there's five. Talking can cause you trouble or make for peace. Six instances, and then I threw in Peter for a seventh, just so you'd have that one, because it's a good tie-in verse. And then gossip, two verses. Well, obviously, over 30 instances, we're not going to look at each one of these, but we're going to look at some of the categories. And hopefully by the time you leave this morning, you will have a a better grasp on how God would have you use your speech. 
first category I want to look at is talk can trap you or deliver you. Here's what Proverbs 12, 13 says. An evil man is trapped by his sinful talk, but a righteous man escapes trouble. So this is real easy to understand. Driving down the street, lights are flashing. Cop pulls you over and says, excuse me, sir, do you know why I pulled you over? And you say, you smell donuts coming out of the trunk? Exact, an example of how trap talk works. That can get you into trouble. I would highly recommend no donut jokes to the cop that pulls you over. Now, you can do that and laugh, and he's going to find 20 things to write you tickets about. Don't do it. Get you into trouble. Or he can pull you over, and you can say, he can say, sir, do you have any idea why I pulled you over? He said, well, I didn't, but when I saw your lights, I looked at my odometer, and I was going seven over. I had no idea. Um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't know. You're just going to freak them out, for starters. Honesty, admission, apology, integrity. Chances are he's going to say, well, just be careful. I'll just give you a warning this time. Have a nice day. The first guy is going to get 20 citations. An evil man is trapped by his sinful talk, but a righteous man escapes trouble. Our lips can get us into trouble, and our lips can get us out of trouble. And the scriptures are teaching us, be wise. Don't use your lips to get you into trouble. Loose lips sink ships. Just be careful what you say. This one, Proverbs 13, 3. Keep what you know to yourself, and you'll be safe. Talk too much, and you're done for. I don't know what it is, but sometimes it's better just to keep what you know private. How many of you have ever said too much, and it's gotten you into trouble? Let me see your hands. Yeah. It, it, it happens. I've always heard this said, God has given us two ears and one mouth so we can listen twice as much as we talk. I like it. It's nice. All right, so there's the first one I wanted to look at. Talk and trap you or deliver you. The next one I want to look at is just restraint. Proverbs 17 says this. A man of knowledge uses words with restraint. Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. So not too long ago, this very popular lack of restraint episode happened. Chances are when I show you this video clip, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Let's kill the lights and take a look. All right, Richard, let me ask you the final play. Take me through it. Well, I'm the best corner in the game. When you try me with a sorry receiver like Crabtree, that's the result you're going to get. Don't you ever talk about me. Who is talking about you? Crabtree, don't you open your mouth about the best. Or you're going to shut it for you real quick. L.O.B. All right, before... And, Joe, back over to you. All right, well, this... Richard, let me ask you the final play. Take me through it. Right, stop that one. We're not ready for that one yet. She goes, oh, who is talking bad about you? Okay, Joe, back over to you. This lady was, like, blown away. He just made a great play. She's trying to interview him on the play, and... All of a sudden, this guy just goes off. And she has no idea what, you know, I don't know this guy. I'm not a sports fan. I don't know anything about this individual. But I can tell you this, when I saw that, I thought, man, this guy looks like an idiot. He's looking like a fool. He may not be one, I'm not saying he is. I'm just saying that was my impression because he didn't use lack of restraint with his lips. I went and saw some follow-up interviews to see if this guy, you know, apologized. Basically, he said, no, I don't have anything to apologize for. He said, maybe my approach wasn't right, my timing wasn't right, you know, I might have embarrassed my teammates, but I needed to say everything I said about that idiot Crabtree, basically, is what he said, because that guy was calling me out and calling me this and calling me that. It's like, wow, that's a shame. National news. And you think when somebody loses their cool and says something stupid on national news, it just stops there? Oh, it became the talk circuit. And that's the next clip, Paul. Let's take a look at the next clip. Karen Samore, since you're sitting next to, you, to me, and I was watching you watch <laughs> Richard Sherman in that newser just quickly in Seattle, and the point where I saw a lot of the head shake was when he said specifically, people took it further than football. I was just showing passion. What were you thinking as you were shaking your head? I was thinking that I wish I was on, the, on one of these airplanes, you know, those bags. I'll clean it up, regurgitation bags. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, you know, this... When you say crazy things on television, you should expect crazy results. 
And, and I don't want to hear all this talk about, well, he's actually very intelligent. You know, he's got this degree from Stanford. He's that doesn't matter to you? Well, it matters in this sense. It matters that he should know better than to do all of this stuff because you're affecting a whole lot of people beside Richard Sherman, besides the, the Seattle Seahawks, beside the National Football League. That's what he doesn't get, and unfortunately, that's what a lot of people who are supporting this silliness don't get also. I was asking you, we were watching what the one question would be. You would ask Richard Sherman, and you said, why don't you get it? We're going to come back to that, but, but Isaac, let me get to you, because a lot of people saw you know, this rant after this game, called it Bush League. Even a, a high-profile senator got into the act yesterday and saying, because of this whole thing, he's now saying, go Broncos. Take a look. I think Denver, you know, everybody is such a Manning fan, and uh, that uh, loudmouth from Seattle sort of epitomizes the Seattle team to me. So that was John McCain weighing in on this whole thing. You said in your Huffington Post piece <laughs> that, that the heat he's getting isn't just misguided, it's ludicrous. So you disagree with my friend here? Yeah, I do. I mean, one of the big things for me is just that I feel like we should stop judging these athletes based on their words on the field and start judging them by the actions that they take off the field. And if you take a closer look at Sherman, um, you know, and Terrence kind of alluded to it, a lot of the things he does off the field are really great, both for his community and the family that he supports, you know. And when I look at a guy like that, I see, you know, a young kid who was hyped up and lost in the moment. And he made a mistake. There's no doubt about it. He shouldn't have, he shouldn't have said what he said and he shouldn't have come off the way he did, but um, he's clearly an ambassador for his community and the kind of person that if you take into account the things he does off the field, you know, he's an individual that I feel like you can absolutely look up to. Okay, Terrence, I read your piece word for word, and, and forgive me, I mean, you, you basically are saying, hell yes, he should be judged 24-7. This man is a role model <laughs> any and everywhere. I, I mean, that's exactly why you're referring to what I wrote for CNN.com right. today. And, and, and I'll tell you something, two people that I know very well, Hank Aaron, who is the, uh, the greatest player who ever lived, and my dad, okay? Okay, okay? And they both agree with Richard Sherman. They both disagree with me. Okay. And with apologies to Hank Aaron and my dad, I think a lot of people are missing the big picture here. And the big picture where I'm coming from, a person who deals a lot with youth, particularly black youth, this guy is affecting these kids. And this goes back to 1993 when Charles Barkley made that ludicrous statement that I, I am, am not, not a role, a role model, model because we're all role models. And the other thing is with these kids, particularly black youngsters, you've got latest statistics that show that about 70 percent of black youth born today are to unwed mothers. OK, they don't have a positive role model in the household. So they're turning to these rappers and to these athletes as their role models. And when they see some cartoon character out there. Like Even Richard though he Sherman. was saying to, to our own Rachel Nichols, you know, listen, I'm, I'm this guy on the field, I'm this guy off on the field, I want to win. But, Brooke, those kids are not seeing that. They're seeing him acting like a fool on the, on the field, and they think this is the way you're supposed to act, not only in athletics, but in life. Yeah, what can you say? Even McCain got involved on it. National emergency, apparently. <laughs> the Apostle James wrote, everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Maybe you've heard this before. It comes from Mark Twain. It's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> and you know, that sounded very similar to Proverbs 17, 28 that I just read to you. Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent. I love Mark Twain. I, he just got a way of saying things. Better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. The category of restraint. Only you've got the ability to control your tongue. Next category. Using your mouth can make for peace or it can make for trouble. It can get you into trouble or you can make for peace. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but, a har but harsh words stir up anger. So you got two guys talking, and one of them's hot under the collar, and he says something. He kind of escalates and says something angry and loud. Now, you've got an option at that point. You can meet him at that level. You can exceed him at that level, or you can intentionally take it down a notch. If you meet him, it's going to escalate. If you exceed him, it's going to escalate more. But if you go down a notch, 
you might take him down a notch too and get out of trouble. I've used this proverb many times in my life and I have diffused many ugly circumstances. I, har I strongly encourage you to do it. No, it's not the first thing that comes to mind when somebody's reaming into you. You want to ream back and give them what for. But that's not the Christian way. We don't give what for. Yeshua, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. That's what we want to be. We want to be peacemakers. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Well, sometimes it's at that fight level where people are yelling at each other, but sometimes you can just say something, even write an email or a text, and if you use just a few poorly chosen words, you're going to annoy somebody. You're going to tick somebody off. I got a text like that this week. I know the person didn't mean any harm, but the way the text came across, it was offensive. It got my hackles up because some of the words that he used were words that he should not have used, words that this guy in this next video will teach us not to use when we have dialogue. Let's take a look. When handling a conflict, your choices of words do matter. The wrong words can heighten tensions, even when your purpose is just the opposite. Let's take a look at six of these words that usually escalate a conflict. The word but immediately indicates disagreement and rejection of the other party's viewpoint. It's toxic when it's the first word you use in response to another statement. In short, it makes others feel rejected and makes them feel they're not getting a fair hearing. The word should places you in a position of superiority, as if you have the right to advise the other party on how to act. It's one more way to make others feel defensive and hostile. The next toxic word is you, because it has an accusatory feel to it. It's a verbal way of pointing fingers. In response, others are likely to return an accusation and escalate matters. Always and never indicate a sense of certainty that will likely aggravate the others. Always and never are harsh absolutes, and that's why they escalate tension. They make others feel they're always wrong or always at fault. Can't has a negative feel in just about any situation, but it's especially counterproductive during confrontations. It puts you in a position of authority, the other person is not gonna like, as if it's you who gets to make the rules. And it's negativity escalates the tension and make everyone feel the situation is hopeless. There are simple ways to communicate when your goal is to diffuse tension. Choose your words carefully to give yourself the best chance for success. Avoid using these six words. I, I totally agree with him. Uh, so I wrote a little sentence, but you should always take his advice. Never ignore it. You can't succeed otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Gossip. Next category. Proverbs 16, 28. Gossip is spread by wicked people. They stir up trouble and break up friendships. If you have seen a friendship broken up over gossip, can I see your hand, please? Yep, and if you've seen trouble stirred up by gossip, can I see your hand, please? Wow, even more hands went up that time. Now this next question, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, because this one hurts. It started out saying, gossip is spread by wicked people. Don't raise your hands. But how many of you have ever spread gossip? Yowzer. Is that saying I'm a wicked person? Or is, it, is there a way out of that? <laughs> Maybe it's the other guys who are spreading gossip, the ones who do it all the time. Maybe they're the wicked people. I don't know. I really don't. I, I, I just think gossip's bad. If you want to be a good person, stay away from it. You know, it's, it's deadly. It's, 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 it's vile. There's this huge commentary on the Bible, on the Old Testament, called the Talmud. Actually, the Talmud has a commentary on a commentary on the Bible. And this is what the Talmud says about gossip. Listen. Uh, um, bah, 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 bah. The sages say that for three transgressions, one forfeits his portion in the world to come. They're saying if you do one of these three things, you'll never get into heaven. Murder, adultery, and idol worship. And an evil tongue is equivalent to all three. Do you hear what they're saying? They're saying... Gossip is the worst of all of them. 
and in their opinion, murder is enough to keep you out of heaven, and gossip's worse than murder. I think it's okay to talk about people as long as you're saying something nice about them. I just don't think it's okay to talk about people if you're not saying something nice about them. The dictionary's definition of gossip, listen to this. Idle talk or rumor, especially about the personal or private affairs of others. Did you hear the word untrue in there? Or the word lie in there? Or the word intentional in there? No. I've, I've heard people say, I just heard it on TV a couple weeks ago, it's not gossip if it's true. Apparently, it's irrelevant whether it's true or not. If you say something about somebody else that makes them look bad, whether it's true or not, that's gossip and you shouldn't do it. I think it's okay if I said, you know, the band gets here early every Sunday so that they can practice to lead you in worship. And they come here every weeknight, every Wednesday night to practice. They give up family time, fun time, rest time, and job time. Those are true statements. I can say that because it doesn't make them look bad. In fact, it makes them look good. But if I were to say something like, Rich got here a half hour late this morning to band practice. Jose yelled at him. Mark threw a water bottle, bounced off the... You know, none of that happened. I'm just <laughs> making it up. It might all be true, but I have no business saying it. What, what's the benefit of saying it? What good comes from it? Nothing. What bad comes from it? A lot. So gossip is when you say something that has no benefit and it makes people look bad. Don't do it. Listen to what Proverbs 18.8 says about it. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's inmost parts. Gossip plants seeds. Seeds of distrust, of doubt, and disgust. I have heard things about people that there was no evidence for them. Somebody swore they were true, and it made that person look bad. Years have passed, and that's still in my mind about those people. Can I trust them? Oh, years. It's not right. Maybe that's why it's such an evil thing. You know, it's easy to plant a seed of gossip, but try to dig it out. It just doesn't, it doesn't go out. It's, it's so easy to get in and so hard to get out. And so it's better to just not let it happen, to stop it in its tracks. I don't know how to undo the damage of gossip. I don't have any advice for you. I don't know how to do it. So my advice to you is don't do it. Cut it short. Don't let it happen. Don't be the speaker of it. And don't be the listener of it because it's going to hurt you. It's going to make you think poorly of somebody you shouldn't think poorly of. Just stop the conversation. And there's ways to do that. You can do it gracefully or not gracefully. That's entirely up to your personality. When somebody comes up, hey, did you hear so-and-so? No, and I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to hear about so-and-so. Or try this one. Have you heard about so-and-so did such-and-such? -such? No, let's go talk to him and see if it's true. No! Well, why not? Let's go see. They're right over there. No, I'm not. Come on, I'm going to go talk to him. You will mortify this person. <laughs> Chances are they will never come to t talk to you again. They'll probably talk about you, but they won't come talk to you. And that's fine, because you can't shut them up anyway. As long as they're not talking to you, you've got half the battle won right there. But what do you do when they're talking about you? Don't worry about it. Nothing you can do about it. Don't worry about it. Um, this is a problem for children, because they have to learn how to deal with it. So I found a video clip that addresses gossip at the level of middle school. And I think you'll find some great advice in there, even though it's aimed at children. Let's take a look. Handling gossip and rumors can be incredibly difficult. And it can be really hard to understand why anyone would want to start a nasty rumor about you. It's important to keep in mind that if someone has started a rumor about you that's just completely false, it's honestly just to do with their own insecurities. They're just trying to hurt you to make themselves feel better. So try not to take it personally. What you want to do is make sure that your best friends know the truth. When someone wants to know something, they always go to the best friend, right? So make sure that your best friends are able to say, oh, that's, no, of course that's not true. And they can help you set the record straight. If you hear someone in the hallway talking about this nasty rumor going around, 
don't confront them and get in their face and be like, that's not true, why would you say that? Or anything super dramatic and ridiculous and something that belongs in a reality show. Instead, casually drop it into conversation later when you're all talking like, oh, I heard this ridiculous rumor about me today, of course this isn't true. Play it off casually, like, oh, you don't really care that that rumor's been started because that's not true. And that kind of stuff doesn't bother you, right? At least pretend like it doesn't. The best thing I can say about dealing with rumors and gossip is to relax a little bit. And that's the hardest thing to do when you hear that other people are saying things about you. But just try not to worry about it. The truth is, everyone's gonna find something else to talk about in like five minutes. So if you can get through it, you'll be very happy you did. Just ignore it. Don't worry about it. It'll blow over sooner or later. You know, some things in life, the more attention you give them, the worse they get. Like throwing gas on the fire. And I know this might be a lame illustration to some of you, but for me, it's perfect. This makes me think about dogs. Now, I'm a dog person. I've had dogs most of my life. Most of my pets have been dogs. I kind of understand them. Um, but when I watch Caesar Milan and the Dog Whisperer, now I really understand dogs. And dogs are very... Um, they feed off your energy. They, they, they're very, I don't know, they're sensitive. If you're uptight, they're uptight. You're easy going, they're easy going. So imagine a strange dog over there, and you do something like this. That dog is going to be all over you like white on rice because you just freaked it out. You just told them you're a scary person to be afraid of, and you've got, you've got that, that mojo coming off of you. Or, or how about this one? And th we have a Doberman. Doberman's kind of scary looking. She's heavy, she's big, scary looking dog. So somebody comes over to the house and I say, listen, we've got a big scary dog, but she's a nice dog, just, just ignore her. I always tell people when they come into my house, ignore my dog. That's what dogs like. You just ignore them. They come up, they sniff you, you're not dangerous, you're not exuding any vibes, and in a few minutes their head's on your lap. So this person comes over to my house, steps in the do door, sees the Doberman and goes, whoa! She jumped and barked and started barking at this person. My dog doesn't bark at people when they come in the house like that. But this person just said, bark at me, I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you ignore the dog, they don't give you any grief. Most dogs. But you get all into their business and they don't know how to deal with it. It's like that with gossip. You just ignore it and it won't give you any grief. But you give it attention, everybody's talking about it. Next thing you know, it's on national news. Jesus said, and I quote, I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now, Jesus came and died for our sins. That means if we give him our life, you know, we tell him we're sorry, we don't want to be sinful anymore, we, we will reject sinful behavior, best we can, of course, and pledge to follow him, he forgives us all our sins, past, present, and future. So we have a standing in heaven that's, that's, that's you know, it's clean. It's a clean slate. The Bible puts it this way. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He swapped places with us when he was crucified. He took all our sin upon himself and gave us his righteousness so that when we pass into the next life and stand before God, he doesn't see all our sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ in us. And then he makes it so we will always be that way from that point forward. So when it says you'll be judged by everything you say, what's he talking about? Well, in part, he's talking about people who have not yet had their sins cleansed by Jesus, in part. Because whether your sins are forgiven or not, there's still accountability in the afterlife, usually for reward, not for punishment. But the point I want to make to you really isn't the afterlife or reward or punishment. I wanted to give you that picture. But the power and danger of words. They're so important that God keeps a record of everyone that comes out of your mouth and we're held accountable for them. That's what I wanted to share with you. Loose lips sink ships. So before I let you go, I want to share with you a couple more passages, including my two favorite passages in the Bible. Just in seven Proverbs, we saw 30 passages. That's too many. 
Can we narrow it down to a couple really good ones? Yes. Here's my, two of my favorites. First one, death and life are in the power of the tongue. By the way, that was in our reading this week, Proverbs 18, 21. And it's so easy to memorize. You just got to hear it once and you can memorize it. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I would encourage you to memorize it. Understand that through your mouth, you can sink a ship or save a soul. Our lips have the ability to do amazing things, good and bad. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Ephesians 4.29 is a bit more poetic. In fact, I'm going to do the King James version of it because I like it so much. Listen, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Basically, it says, don't let anything bad come out of your mouth, only good stuff that builds people up and doesn't tear them down. That's how you might say it in modern lingo. Minister grace to the hearers. Don't let anything filthy come out. Beautiful passage of scripture. So, last category, talk can harm or heal. Proverbs 12, 18, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So a tongue can slice like a sword or heal somebody. It can damage or fix. I love it. But Proverbs 16, 24 on the positive side says, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. You know, I had a dream about honey last night. I wonder if it's because I knew I was going to give this passage to you. It was a freaky dream. I was in Israel, and I was with a friend there who had a piece of property overlooking this huge vista. It was beautiful. And he raised bees. And the bees were like that big. But they weren't killer bees. You could go right next to them. They didn't mess with you. And they made so much honey, it was gushing out of the ground like an artesian spring. And my dog, the Doberman, ran over to honey and started drinking it. And of course, I pulled her off because that wasn't our honey. Wackadoodle dreams. It's like, where did that come from? Probably because I'm filling my mind with this verse. I don't know. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Let me prove it to you. Let's take a look at my final video. <clears throat> You're spectacular. Unique, sophisticated. Just make a lady feel good. I love that sign. Getting fit. Up top, have a great day. Look how cute you are. That's you, very kind of you. I've complimented a lot of people today, but deep down in my heart, I love that bow tie. Hey. Please kind of that suit suits you, sir. You're looking good. Oh, thanks. Looking great? Yes. Yes, you are. Thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. Sam, bringing some mirth to the people of our great city here. Peace and love. Peace and love. Mustache. Top notch. Hey, how's it going here, guys? Look at you guys. Doing, looking good. How are you? Doing good. Ooh, why, thank you. Just trying my best. What else you Hey, little guys. Hey, oh, no. It's okay. Oh, you're cute. No, stop. You're, he's protecting you, though. That's good. You got a good guard dog there. Put a smile on your face. It did mine. It cheered me up. I thought that was so cool. The one that I liked the most was the guy with the bow tie. He's like looking at this guy like, what an idiot. And he's ready to walk away. He said, but I really like your bow tie. And he came over and shook his hand. Words, man, they're a honeycomb, sweet to the soul. You know, another favorite passage, I only gave you two, so you can't think on this one. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. I like that. So I would like to encourage you this week to just be real careful about what you say. Not only on the negative to not say it, but to do the positive. Now, I knew this lesson was coming. Plus, you know, I try to practice what I preach. You don't always succeed. But I was out to lunch with Joseph this week. And we were at a buffet, and I got a piece of steak. And, you know, it's hit or miss at a buffet. Any steak is hit or miss. I like good steak. I don't like not good steak. This was a good steak. So. I decided I was going to go over and tell the chef 
that it was a good piece of steak. You know, he, he's just sitting there all day, thankless job, flipping over pieces of meat. No, I want medium well. No, I want medium rare. No, this one's too cooked. No, that's not cooked enough. No, that piece is too rough. I'm, I'm sure he gets sick of hearing it. So I just went over and said, man, that was a really good cooked steak. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Have a nice night. You too. Just, just, you can make somebody's day. Just tell them thank you for what they're doing, you know? And I'd like to encourage you, go spread some love this week. Sound good? By the way, I asked you to fill out a little piece of paper, put it in the offering box. I even helped you. Music too loud, music not too loud. But if you put in a mean slip of paper, I'm going to tweet it. And I'm going to let the world see what you put in there. <laughs> I won't put your name on there because that would be gossip. Now, it's Communion Sunday. Our opportunity to come before the Lord, tell him we remember what he did for us. And we thank him for doing it. Now, at Book of Life... We do it a little differently. We don't have people pass this out. You come up and serve yourself. We have three stations, um, three places you can choose from. We have grape juice and little pieces of cracker because when Jesus was there at that Last Supper, that Passover dinner, he took the matzah, the, the unleavened bread, he broke it, he distributed it to the disciples and said, this is my body which is broken for you. And then when he passed out the wine, he said, this is my blood shed for many, the blood of the new covenant. So we know that Jesus volunteered himself as a sacrifice for our sins to give us the opportunity to be saved. And it was a huge sacrifice. And so we thank him. We tell him we remember. We tell him we remember in this activity. We tell him we remember in the way we live our lives day after day after day. A couple of rules with the communion. If you've not given yourself to Jesus 100%. You have two options right now. Just let this part of the service pass and it'll be done in a couple of minutes. Or pray and say, you know, Lord, I really haven't committed myself to you 100%. I've been kind of half in, half out. I've been thinking about it, but I haven't made a full-blown commitment. I'm in. I pledge to follow Jesus for the rest of my days, whatever that means. I believe he died for my sins and rose again and I pledge to avoid sin to the best of my ability. And then you can come up and take communion. Now, if you've already made that commitment and you've given your heart to Jesus, but there's something going on in your life right now that you know isn't right, again, you have two options. You can let this moment pass, or you can ask Jesus to forgive you, to strengthen you, and promise you will do your utmost to please him. So I'm going to ask the band to come on up, lead us in some background worship, while you take a few moments to pray. By the way, this box is a reminder. You can use any of them. But also once a month, we take up a second collection for those in need in our congregation. We feed people. We help them with their medical bills. We help pay rent. If you want to help the people in your community, in this congregation, feel free to donate generously or put it in the box and mark that that's what it's for.
So you're going to get an uh, opportunity to meet Steve Kaplan. He'll be up front here. Just uh, feel free to come by and introduce yourself. Don't forget, if you're visiting with us, to bring your little blue slip over to the visitor table. Say hi to Susie. She's got a gift for you. Wednesday night, 5.30 dinner, 6 o'clock for our small groups with worship. I hope you have an amazing, blessed week. Go use some great words and watch what happens. God bless you. You're dismissed. Give me 